Hello, good evening, and good morning to our friends in the Philippines. My name is uh, Eric Lachica. I'm the Washington, D.C. coordinator for the U.S. Filipinos for Good Governance. We have a very uh, exciting uh, town hall forum uh, this evening. And uh, without, without further ado, hopefully, uh, oh, by the way, let, uh, if everyone uh, could uh, sign in on the chat page, their name, their organization and where you reside, para we have a frame of reference, especially during the Q&A and your comments, you can put on the chat page. So um, uh, hopefully our, is Dr. Angie Cruz ready for our opening prayer? She's not in yet, but maybe she can lay the book before she introduces our guest. Sige. Uh, Tita Loida, are you ready to give a opening prayer and introduction? Yes, yes. So let us put ourselves in God's presence. Loving Father, Lord of all creation, we praise you, we bless you, we glorify you, and we thank you for today for our speaker who has, for our speaker who has remained indomitable, whose fighting spirit is ever vital. Continue to bless her and keep her in good health. And for all of us who are listening, O oh Lord, help us to be vigilant because vigilance is the price of our freedom. And we ask you to look with mercy on our people in the Philippines. We bleed, we suffer, we know their pain, and we ask for your mercy. And we ask for your assistance, especially with this coming election. We ask this all in the name of your son, our Lord. Amen. 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 Uh, is that Angie? Okay, thank you, thank you. So, um, Eric, is it my time to- Yes, it is, uh, go ahead. Okay, yes, 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 thank you, thank you. I have the honor of introducing our speaker today. She is one of our nation's many unsung heroes. When she was a young woman, she became a political prisoner and a tortured victim of the Marcos Marshall, Marshall rule. Because of that, after people power, she became the former chair of the Claimants 108. And you can ask her about that. And when President Noinoy Aquino became president, she was named chair of the Commission on Human Rights of the Philippines. Today, she is a special lecturer in the De La Salle College at St. Benilde School of Diplomacy and Governance. She is also the Chair Emeritus of Akbayan Citizens Action Party, a board member of the Institute for Political and Electoral Reform, and a member of the Philippine Coalition for the International Criminal Court. And as you know, uh, the, uh, the ICC has, is about to send complaint against the President Duterte. And so for her indomitable spirit, let us, uh, let us listen for the true events of our nation's past. And so it's uh, my great honor to welcome Honorable Eda Han Rosales. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. <clears throat> Do I start now? Yes. <clears throat> Do I start now? Or <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. <clears throat> it's my pleasure. Loida, Eric, between 
everybody who has helped in organizing this very important event. It's my pleasure to be here and to be invited. It's a privilege. It's my first time to be invited <clears throat> in a webinar in the United States for quite some time, ever since the pandemic, you might put it that way. Now, um, let me say a little something about um, myself because everybody always says, you know, you don't know me in the States, you don't know what happened to me. So let me just say a few things. When I was um, under martial law, or even before martial law, I didn't know much about what was happening, but there was a very active student movement. And <clears throat> the students could be heard over radio, over, you know, um, yeah, a lot over radio. And they had this Kamanyang and they had Babaylan, uh, so they would go from one school to another. I used to study, I mean, teach in uh, UE and then Jose Rizal College. And so I would invite the students or I'd be very, very open to the students coming in. The owner of the school, Jose Rizal College, uh, Dr. Fabelia, uh, was also very open, very liberal as a matter of fact. So we could uh, listen to the students and they would have pagtatanghal plays about what was happening. So I said, iba naman na tinuturo nila ay ang sinasabi ng mga bata kesa dun sa aking tinuturo. You know, I was teaching conventional history and they were talking about the three ismos, the roots of the problems of uh, the Philippines. You know, they were talking about burokrata kapitalismo, imperialismo, and feudalismo. And of course, I couldn't understand what they were saying. So uh, to, make a, to make it short, I decided to take up master's graduate studies in UP. And I asked uh, the owner of the school if I could do that. And because he was so liberal, he gave me a scholarship. And uh, that made me enter you know, some of the organizations there that went into more serious study about what was happening, the roots of the problem. I was able to go to one rally, just one rally where they were talking about tuition fees. I think um, Odi Corpus was the head of DepEd at the time, no? or they called it DEX, Department of Education, Culture and Sports. And uh, they were very, the teachers were talking about increased fees for their salaries and then <clears throat> tuition fees should be regulated and so on and so forth. So finally, there was what was known as the first quarter storm that was going on and the students would be <clears throat> uh, going to Malacanang and um, you know, uh, coming out with their protests in Malacanang. Now to put this in context, because it's, this did not come out of a clear blue sky, there was a very strong global peace movement at the time against Americans who continued to fight in Vietnam. So that global peace movement was what we understood because they wanted Americans to stop fighting. And uh, true enough, why not let the Vietnamese fend for themselves, work it out for themselves, the way President Biden is you know, treating the Afghanistan now. And so I could understand that, but the peace movement reverberated in Europe, in America, in Japan, everywhere else. And bits and pieces of all these came to the Philippines. So a bit of imperialism I started to study and learn. And since the American bases were all over the place, especially Clark Air Base and Subic Naval Base, the biggest bases, that much I understood. And the United States needed Marcos, a loyalist, to protect the US military bases. So 
um, martial law was declared and we're not going to debate over it was the 21st or the 22nd or the 23rd. Um, he had it declared on the 21st, but I think that act, the actual implementation took place on the 23rd. And uh, so when martial law was declared, um, people started, uh, started questioning, you know, started uh, announcing this over the radio. And um, a little afterwards, things happened. The, you know, the media was silenced and a friend of mine called me up and said, Etta, Etta, please help me because my husband, actually it was Joel Rocamora, my husband was uh, taken to Fort Bonifacio. Oh, don't worry about that. I'll take care of that. Because si Cape Pidiokno was a friend of everybody and he was the lawyer ng bayan. So I called up at Cape Pidiokno's office and I said, I'd like to talk to Cape Pidiokno. May ang sumagot ba naman ay napakalaking boses. Sino to? So I said, I would like to talk to Cape Pidiokno. Sino to? <laughs> Nakakatakot yung boses. So hindi na ako kumibo. So with that, I hung up. And I, that was the first time I felt fear because Kape Pedyokno was no longer there. And the voice was strange and hostile. And then that was when we learned that everybody was brought to Fort Bonifacio. A few days after, about two weeks later, about October 5, a uh, military came around. You know, my, my husband used to play golf in Campo Ginaldo and he needed a driver. So there's, there was one who offered himself as a driver. So he, when he was, the driver was here, and then I said, I have to, it's, I, I think that martial law is declared now. We have to hide my books. And I, I didn't know anything much yet, but then I had volumes and volumes of Mao Zedong books because I loved to read them since, uh, and I got them, I bought them from uh, China. At that time again, while China had opened its doors to everybody, everybody, and they were inviting us for free. They were inviting the newspaper men. They were inviting the teachers. They were inviting the students. They were inviting everybody. So we went there and we were really quite impressed with the way China had developed itself. They had the children's palace and you could see how talented little children from grade six, I mean grade six, from six years of age and to 12 years and so on in the children's palace were being taught how to do acupuncture, how to dance, how to sing, really talented. So we were also impressed with China and we, we were so impressed we brought all those books. So when I had those books, my driver told me, uh, bahala na ako. Uh, I will hide your books. So indeed he took my books and he hid my books, but he hid them in Camp Krame, never to be seen again. And that was the reason why they picked me up uh, on October, I think it was either October 5 or October 6. And they picked me up and they brought me to Camp Aguinaldo and they started interrogating me. Do I know Jose Maria Season? Well, I've heard of him, I've read about him. So they thought, uh, does he try to get in touch with you? What a silly question. He doesn't even know me. Why should he get in touch with me? And I don't know him either. So actually, I really don't, didn't know much about the links of the Communist Party to the movement that was going on at the time. And so uh, eventually, but we were all in Camp Krame. And in Camp Krame, this was not in Fort Bonifacio. In Fort Bonifacio, People were put there in Bartolina, 
and you know, talagang iba ang treatment doon. And that was where Kape Pediokno was placed, some of our teachers, you know, some of the teachers. Pero in Camp Krame, it was a smiling martial law. And Heidi Yorak, who was still alive, was there. She was teaching in uh, the College of Law. And so everything was uh, nice and dandy. Uh, we don't have napkins here, sabi ko. So dala naman sila ng napkins. I want to swim, ni kanong ni Heidi Yorak. So, binigay sa kanya yung swimming pool ng Camp Krame, no? So, everything was squad. Tapos, I met Joe Concepcion, the capitalist at the time, and there he was. He kept on cleaning around the, uh, his cut para baka may mga, para hindi siya ma-infect ng mga the rest of the people around him. And that was the rest of us, no? So, I thought that was very funny. And then, Bongkalan, the smugglers were also kept in another room. Ito naman sa Campo Ginaldo, when we were placed in Campo Ginaldo na. And uh, they used to have so much smuggled food. And they were allowed this much. And so on. So all of these things kept in my mind. Pero mababaw pa lang. Media people were there. So ultimately, I was released. And I remember saying, I have to go now. By, by the way, my husband was also taken in. Uh, why was he taken in? A few days after I was taken in. Well, for harboring a lawless element, I happened to be the lawless element. So those were the reasons that were given to us. And when I was released, I said, well, you have to bring me home. Nobody's going to pick me up. Mom, we don't do that. We just arrest people and then we release them but we don't bring home the people that we arrest. Well, that's never a first time that you can do it, I said. So I insisted that they bring me home. Malapit lang naman ang bahay ko, which was 13th Avenue, a few, uh, you know, meters away from Camp Aguilar. Ultimately, they brought me home. And that was my first arrest. That was 1972. But later on, things got worse. Marcos silenced the media. That's the difference. Marcos silenced the media. Marcos, of course, ABS-CBN was silenced. And Marcos had you know, silenced the people's organizations. Then he declared agrarian reform. PD-27. So everybody was so impressed with Marcos. And before he declared martial law, he asked the Americans, I think it was Reagan. Was it Reagan? Or maybe Lyndon Johnson? I don't know. I remember. The first that he said, he was told, you have to protect the U.S. military bases. And he said, I guarantee you, I will protect the U.S. bases. So Americans supported the martial law. <laughs> you remember, Americans are supposed to be for democracy, but in this case, they protected a dictatorship because Marcos always believed in a dictatorship. In fact, when he was a young boy, I remember, I mean, this is of course from my readings in the College of Law, he believed in constitutional authoritarianism. We wrote an essay about that. And uh, of course, you know, you can read the stories about him. And he said that if you want for a country to succeed because of the problems that we have, you have to be strong. You have to be authoritarian. You have to be a disciplinarian. Then you can put your policies in place. And this is what he tried to do with the help of the Americans when he declared martial law. So necessarily, the businessmen were impressed. The upper echelons of society were impressed. And the international community was impressed. But that didn't last long because Marcos did not allow the freedoms, did not allow media 
and did not allow human rights to be exercised. So by 1975, already you had the first Latondena strike and you had the workers strike with the, teach, with the church people beside them and it reverberated. And even if we didn't hear, I mean, you know, even if there was no media, the, through whispers, we heard about the workers. And because of that, you know, the workers became, you know, other workers started to strike and other workers started to strike. It was, you know, like a domino for the workers. By 1976, I had to go underground. And well, because nobody could speak about Brown. And so by then I was arrested. I was arrested and ibang usapin na ito. It was a different thing altogether. I was arrested along with some of my friends and we were brought to a place where it was in passing. They called it a safe house, the military. We called it a torture chamber. And this was where the torture began. They started to pour wax candle over my me, my body. And, uh, you know, it just, it hurt, of course. So I kept on saying, ouch, ouch. And so some of the agents started shouting, ouch, I know, ouch. Why does she keep on screaming, ouch? Kalo ko ba makabayad siya? Kalo ko ba makapilipino siya? Dapat aray. Dapat aray, di ba? You know, I wanted to laugh. But I was being tortured. Pero tama naman sila, dapat aray. Hindi dapat ouch. So, <laughs> I got to, you know, this were the, can you imagine? You know, Lloyd, these were the things I would remember. You know? <laughs> it would register in my mind. Bakit nga naman ouch ako ng ouch? Dapat makabayan ako. So that was just the light part of it. They were pouring candle wax over me. And then they started taking off my clothes because I did not want to cooperate. Then they started, put, uh, you know, getting a belt and suffocating me with a belt so I could no longer, I could no longer breathe. So, you know, it's so pahirap na pahirap, pahirap na pahirap. And then they started taking off my clothes and then to molest me. And then they said, okay, are you still going to cooperate? Di pa rin, di pa rin. So they started putting a dirty cloth over my, my, my mouth. And you know, iba yung tod, yung kwan, water pure. Pero ito, I could not breathe. And uh, then they started asking questions. And all throughout, it would, you know, I would remember how am I expected to answer those questions when I am being suffocated, when I am being tortured. If they removed the dirty cloth with water from my mouth, then maybe I could answer the questions. You know, uh, I'm saying this to you because these are the things that I remember. I can remember the pain, but I can also remember a mind that was alert, a mind that kept on thinking and kept on um, thinking and uh, um, analyzing. So I don't know if that was what made me survive, but a separate mind that kept on analyzing while I could feel the physical pain. So finally, they removed the dirty cloth. Then I pretended I was going to die, you know? So I you know, started losing my breath and I just, no, no, I, I wasn't resisting anymore. But of course they knew it better. They knew that I wasn't dying. So they kept on with the cloth, putting it on them and they're asking me all those questions. Finally, they removed the cloth. And then I guess by, by then I already was so exhausted. Pagod na pagod at nasasaktan ako. And uh, hirap na hirap ako. So I said, I gave a name. So they said, wow, nakakuha sila 
ng ay, kasi yun naman ang gusto nila makuha sa akin eh to get my friends in the underground movement so they gave a name and they went to teachers village to look for that name because i gave the address and of course when they gave the name when they gave the name and the address they went to unto asila uhulihin na nila siya tapos noon sabi nung tao doon ay sir isang taon na wala na yan nagpunta na sa america yan wala na siya hindi na siya pumunta rito hindi na namin makita siya isang taon na ho so they came back talagang galit na galit kasi nilin lang po sila. Nagsinungaling ako sa kanila. And that was the time when they did the worst thing. That was the time when they electrocuted me. They electrocuted me. And ang sakit. Masakit ang kuryente. Kasi hindi ba lethal injection? Yung kwan, uh, pagka hindi naman lethal injection, electrocution, kills you. So they just kept on increasing and increasing the voltage. And I started screaming. Then I was no longer analyzing. I could not analyze anymore. I was just screaming to death because it was really painful. Of course, that must have taken just seconds because if it had taken minutes, but I know. And they knew, they knew exactly just how much until finally I was just screaming and I don't know how long it took and then they stopped and by then I was already in I was in convulsions I was convulsing my whole body and I could not stop and I I had lost control of my body so they took me and they felt that is it they got me and they put me inside the room their room where they used to sleep and they put me on the dirty cushion that smelled of them and their sweat and just put me there and I was convulsing and convulsing and convulsing and I couldn't stop and so by then then they took the tape no the but tape during our time tape pa yan nun eh and then they played the tape of all the revolutionary songs amasa amasa lamang and i played they played it and i hated it i really hated it and that was a way of dehumanizing a person they were making a mockery ayan pakinggan mo yan pakinggan mo yan and in the middle nga pala of the all the torture when they were torturing me they said yan ang napalamo the agents would scream, you know, some of them, yan ang napalamo, kasi ikaw, binagsak mo ko. Oh my God, I said, these are some of my students. These are some of my students. And, you know, they would enroll in my class because in, they would enroll at night because I taught night classes in UE and in Osiris College. So, they were talaga mga ahente who enrolled in my class. So there, and I, it was a mockery. They tried to dehumanize me. They tried to destroy me. I could just hear the songs. And so finally, when they had, I was already quiet. And I don't know how long it I don't know how long it took. And I don't know. I just lost time, time, days. I just didn't know. And because the, the men, they would go on top of you. They'd go on top of you. And they'd play with you. And when the door would open, when the, somebody would knock at the door and the door would open, they didn't all stand up. So I said to myself, then I could start thinking again, oh, this is not allowed. This is unofficial torture. They're torturing me, the man there, all over me. You know, the definition of rape, that's, that's rape. 
when they were all over you. And that's rape. And I said, this is unofficial torture. What I experienced when they were electrocuting me, that was official torture. <clears throat> so I was making this difference. And they would stop. They'd stand up. So these were AMS that were making, taking advantage of me. And then they would say to me, oh, kumusta na siya? Ah, okay lang siya. Okay lang siya. Siyempre ako nakabusal. Ako, tsaka naka, nakapiring ako. I was blindfolded. And then, <clears throat> afterwards, when I had quieted, there would be an agent who would you know, bring me, bring me a necklace from Kiapo. He said, I'm going to Kiapo now. I'll buy you a necklace and I'll buy you some food. So he did. Because he didn't want to eat. Then the agents, the agents, the ones who were molest, sexually molesting me. Although, you know, Raisa Robles would explain, Etha, that's rape, that's rape. <clears throat> they were molesting me. And then at the same time, one of them would feed me, would buy sardinas and rice. <coughs> Excuse me. Would buy that. And I would, I would eat because he would feed me. And he brought me a necklace. It was a necklace of Sampaguita in Quiapo. It's what you sell to the bus drivers and they put it on you know, the mirror and it smelled so good. It was a moment. It was a moment of truth, of, of beauty. It was God's moment. And it was like God saying, I am here so I appreciated that. That's why I don't forget that. That was a moment of truth. And it was brought by the agent. And the agent said, Itatakas kita, gusto mo. And I said, no, I don't know. I did not want to be in the hands of an unofficial torturer. I would rather be in the hands of official torture. Because if anything happened to me, they would ultimately know. Because this is official. Whereas they was, you know, the agent, the Takasapo, I will be just one of the desaparecidos. Although, of course, when they were torturing me, the, the, the colonels, the, the people, the of officers who arrested me, they said, Eta, do you know that Marcos doesn't know that you're here? He doesn't know. Nobody knows. So we can kill you if we want to. You remember that. Nobody knows who you are, where you are. And true enough. Nobody knew. In any event, when things quieted down, I refused being one of the possible des desaparecidos because if they took me, this man who treated me like a cat, a collection, a collector, like I was like a stray cat in the street. So he took me in and took care of me. So anyway, the official torturers brought me finally. And they brought me to Camp Olivas. And when they brought me there, <clears throat> they took off my tearing. Do you recognize this? He said. So I knew Pampanga, so this is Camp Olivas. So I was 
And then the colonel who was the commander, who was the OIC there. And of course, by then I could talk. And I said, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna do the same thing that you did to me in the torture chamber? Are you gonna do it here again? And then the colonel looked at them and he said, why? Did you touch her? And then all of a sudden I realized they have different policies. Here in Camp Olivas, they probably would not have tortured me because under the, this colonel, because he wondered why they touched me. Anyway, that, those were just moments that learning lessons that they have different policies. I ended up being in fifth MIG. Fifth MIG was the place where the all intelligence officers gathered the military, the army intelligence, the Navy intelligence, the Air Force intelligence, the constabulary intelligence, and then the civilian intelligence that was NICA. So that was fifth meeting. And all they, they would gather all and they would you know, make discussions about who they should uh, capture. And when I was there, they brought me there on their desk for me to sleep. In a list nila ako dun sa torture chamber nila. But then I heard a girl screaming. So I knew that she was being tortured. So I, I, I could imagine that they were doing to her exactly what they did to me. So I screamed and I said, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop torturing her. Stop doing to her what you were doing. Stop it. And so they all came to me. They brought that Corriente. <clears throat> if you don't shut up, we're going to do the same thing to you all over again. Siyempre, natakot ako. Natakot ako. So I kept quiet. <clears throat> and that was it. <clears throat> Later on, I learned her name was Elena Ang. And, and she, in her, when she talks, she says, I threw a bra at her. And I don't remember that, but maybe I did. But she remembers it. Those are moments of truth to her. I must have thrown a bra to her because she was wet and she needed it. There. Later on, I guess we were going to be released. And General Balbarero said, you have anything to say? Then he gave me pieces of paper that I had to, I had to sign. And I said, no, I'm not gonna sign this. You want to edit it? Yes. So I changed everything else. This I'm gonna sign. And he allowed it. So I signed that. And do you have anything more to say? Yes. I stood up. <clears throat> I behaved like I was in Plaza Miranda. And I said to them, once you release me, you must remember, and we are going to win. We are going to win because we are on the side of the people. You, you are only on the side of Marcos. You're, there's very few of you, whereas we, we are many, and we are on the side of the people. We are going to win. You mark my words. I am so sure of that. And then. Colonel who arrested me, or oh, he was a major at the time, went behind my bed. Will you please shut up? He might change his mind and make you, you know, detain you for a longer period. Shut up, we want to release you. So, and my husband sided with that major who arrested me and he said, you shut up. Both of them were already scolding me. And I scolded back. I said, get out of my way. I have not. I'm not yet through with what I have to say to the general. So I did, and the general allowed me. So I finished with what I had to say, and I was released. And the military said, <coughs> Etta, remember, just remember, just keep yourself above board. Don't 
Don't go underground anymore. Just stay. At least we can see you. Once you go underground, you can be killed by anybody. And, you know, I remember that. In a sense, the military, they were thinking of me. Don't, but, but, but when you, you, you stay above ground, you remember. And so when they released me, some of the people underground wanted me to go underground again, but I refused. And I said, no, I will stay above ground because that is the way. And because I still wanted to be with my family. I had my family, I had to take care of my family. My children were growing up. And I stayed above ground. And the military did not touch me anymore. But every four years, I would be so scared that they would arrest me. Because they arrested me in 1976, 1972, then 1976, that's, not, that's four years. So 1976 to 1980, I'd be scared to death. It's another four years. So it became a traumatic thing for me every four years. Anyway, I finally was released. And in the case of Marcos, at the time that I was released, he had already, the people, the workers, as I said in 1975, became much stronger. Segway na ko Marcos, became much stronger. And then the students, gained ground and by 1984, by 19, you know, things were really getting worse. The economy was bad and uh, he kept on borrowing and borrowing. It was a debt driven, export oriented, import dependent development paradigm. In the beginning, people were impressed. The Marcoses, they're unexplained. People were, uh, you know, were so impressed with him, but that didn't last very long because Marcos, the Marcoses, <coughs> from the beginning, the Marcoses borrowed, and they, they did not only borrow, they stole from the coffers of government. Even before they declared martial law, they stole from the coffers of government. And let me just drink this. <clears throat> they stole from the coffers of government as early as 1968, and they put the money in dummy foundations in Credit Suisse accounts of the Swiss banks, and they kept on creating, creating and creating dummy foundations until it became bigger and bigger and bigger. And, you know, they even had to change their names. It was, uh, Marcos was called, um, how was he called again? William Saunders, and Imelda was called Jane, Jane Ryan. Now, I have never found out who Jane Ryan was, but at least I know that, you know, Loita, you have to look it up. Marcus, I mean, uh, William Saunders was a number of people, but he was also from the Confederate. And he was also, you know, one of these Confederate leaders who had a statue somewhere there. Now I think they have removed the statue when they were fighting the Union in America. So he took the name William Saunders and Jane Ryan. And then they had so many foundations. So they kept on. Now that the foundations, the unlawful wealth that you would see with uh, the Marcoses is illegal because when you come up with money and you put them in a foundation, it is intended for charity, for religious purposes for the poor, for the common benefit, but it is not intended to ingratiate yourself and to get, gain more profits. So that in fact was the money that was intended for the Marcos, uh, the, 
which you know William Saunders and Jane Ryan used in the dummy foundations, so that when Imelda Marcos was tried by the Sandigan Bayan because of this unlawful wealth, it was precisely because of this. And this was Republic Act 1379, because the Republic Act says legally it's 1379 that you cannot explain wealth that is way beyond what you have been able to earn all throughout those years. And when, you know, <clears throat> the budget minister of Marcos, I mean, the budget minister much, much later during our time, tried to compute just how much money was earned by Imelda Marcos and Ferdinand Marcos as public officials of the land, it only amounted to from 1966 to 1984 up to 1986, it amounted to 304,372, let me see, I'm not looking at it, 304,372, yes, there it is, 372 pesos and uh, 372 and 43 cents. So it was not even $1 million. But when you look at the unexplained wealth, which are now institutionalized, by the way, everybody, these are now institutionalized in three Supreme Court decisions. Huh? They actually amount to, <coughs> it amounted to 300, um, well, that uh, six hundred fifty-eight million dollars, which is what they got from the dummy foundations, no, in Switzerland, and the wealth <clears throat> includes mga jewelry, and then that they were able to collect. You can go ahead with that. This does not explain it, no? Stanislaw. The largest ever theft from a government according to the Guinness World Records as having perpetrated a record that you're still holding up to 2020. Now, I don't know if Duterte has already actually taken over, but as far as the Marcos is concerned, world over, huh? world over, the William Saunders and Jane Ryan accounts came up with <coughs> 300, I mean, $658 million. And then the, you can go ahead and show. And then afterwards, the Arelma account, which is the same as the uh, Dummy Foundations account, because it was $2 million from the Dummy Foundations that was put into Arelma to start the Arelma account until it, yun, in 1972. But the account had grown to approximately $35 million by 2000 and $42 million by 2014. This again has been, um, has been in, uh, ruled by the Supreme Court as unlawful and illegal this kind, this uh, realm account. Then um, that's the second Supreme Court decision. Now you have more of the properties of Marcos, the Manhattan properties. By the way, there were four Manhattan properties, the Crown Buildings, no? In Fifth Avenue, the Herald Center at the intersection of Broadway, Sixth Avenue and 34th Street, and then 40 Wall Street, which has since been renamed the Trump building. So President Trump inherited the building of Ferdinand Marcos and 200 Madison Avenue, Midtown, South Central. So itong pinagmamalaki ni President Trump were actually kay Marcos lahat yan, no? yung Trump building at least. Okay, uh, before this, 
the July 15, 2003 Supreme Court rulings on Marcos Ilgat and Wealth. And then of course, the second ruling there was the Arelma account. And then the third ruling is a resolution of the Supreme Court first uh, division that had to do with the fourth feature in favor of the government with respect to jewelry pieces known as the Malacanang collection, known as the Hawaii collection, which was confiscated by the Americans when they brought in to uh, Hawaii instead of Hawaii, because they, Marcos really thought that he was being brought to Hawaii. Kala niya, you know, order niya ang Amerikano. But the Americans brought them him to Hawaii. And then the third one was the uh, Rumeliote collection. Rumeliote was a good friend of the Marcoses. And he tried to come up with uh, this collection, tried to smuggle it out of uh, the Philippines, but he was captured by Philippine forces and jewelry was taken out. Okay, <clears throat> so what does Duterte say? Duterte says there is no proof of the Marcoses amassing ill-gotten wealth despite overwhelming evidence. Look at the intelligence of this president. He says there's no proof despite the fact that there were three Supreme Court decisions and Imelda Marcos was found guilty of seven counts of graft. In November 2018, the anti-graft court, Sandigan, ordered the arrest of former Ilocos Norte Imelda Marcos, widow of ousted dictator Ferdinand, who was found guilty of graft. There was no plunder law yet at the time. So they used Republic Act 3019. So she was sentenced to imprisonment of six years and one month to 11 years for each count of graft or a total of 42 years and seven months to 77 years. She was also perpetually disqualified from holding public office. There you are. Uh, this is criminal responsibility because the prosecution say of, uh, um, she violated Republic Act 3019, the Anti-Graft and Corrupt Practices Act. Uh, and so, because she amassed so much wealth, she also violated, she of course and Marcos, Republic Act uh, 1979. Because 1379 was an act that says that your salaries and all your declared assets through sal M should not go beyond a mass property that you cannot explain. And if there is a difference, there's, there's a huge gap between what you claim you own and what you have actually amassed through budget, uh, the budget ministers, you know, uh, accounting, then you are responsible. So I will end with that. I think that is it. And because I'm sure that you have a lot of questions and maybe it's better that we have a question and answer first. Anyway, let me put it this way. I was right after all. Marcos was, I am vindicated because Marcos was ousted. He was ousted because of, he was politically isolated and morally discredited. And by then it was an embarrassment for the United States to continue supporting him. And at that last time when Marcos said, wanted support from the Americans, Senator Laxalt was sent by President Reagan who said, cut and cut cleanly. Bumaba ka na sa pwesto, pero walang dadanak ng dugo. You know, when in America, it should not be violent. That is why it contributed to the fact that when the tanks came, there was the soldiers themselves did not feel because they were isolated already. 
did not feel like ramming the tanks against the people, the Filipino people. And when, just to make it a last point, when there was this last uh, election, the snap election, which the Americans ordered Marcos to do, and you have to have snap elections. When he did the snap elections, ano nangyari? Dinaya niya. It was already Korea Kim, of course. Dinaya niya. And so, halatang halata na dinaya niya, it was 35 women and men, volunteers of the Comelec, stood up and left the Comelec counting during the canvassing session because it was clearly a way where Marcos was cheating his way through. And that did it. That spread out in the international community. And the people never believed Marcos. So he took over and he was ousted. Let me end with that so that the questions, answers and questions can be. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes, very, very harrowing, very touching. Eric. Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Kitayeta, for that uh, very moving presentation. Uh, we have several questions uh, that have been sent uh, to us in advance. And I think I, um, to segue from your presentation, uh, how do you tell your family and children, grandchildren, about the traumatic experiences that you suffered under the Marcos regime? How are you able to heal? What do you think the phrase uh, forgive and forget, which, which some of the Marcos loyalists often say and even accuse those who speak against Marcos as being, quote, bitter? Well, <clears throat> in the case of my children, even when I was during my first detention, my little girl was being carried by my husband to say thank you to Lieutenant Arayeta for allowing them to see me and my little girl, she was about six years old or four years old, and she put up her hand and she hit, wanted to hit him. And I was so proud of her because she was resisting. And they knew and they could not understand what was happening to their mother but they knew that they had to resist. And at one point when my husband was you know, incarcerated and they released me first, during my first arrest, I was carrying my little girl that was Richie and I was bringing her to the intelligence offices. So in order to get the release of my father and she looked up at me and she said, why mama, are they good? military, not just bad military. Are we looking for the good military to release my father, uh, daddy, papa? And I said, yes, I guess we will look for the good military to release my papa. So they were going through the process. I don't know that I told them about the torture. They could have learned about the torture by reading, but uh, slowly by staying with them when I was released. It was a gradual healing with my mother and my family. Now, what was the next question? Forgive and forget? Of course not. You, know, you don't forgive and forget. I mean, you know, the least that the Marcos can do is to make a public apology and to admit that they have stolen the public funds that they have stolen from the government, that they have stolen from the Filipino people, you don't forgive them. But there has to be, I can understand reconciliation, but reconciliation must always be anchored on the principle of justice. And that is where they have to admit. And then Imelda Marcos was convicted and I was jumping up and down in joy. She was convicted on seven counts. But then of course, she is still released up to now. 
Okay. Uh, yes, a, 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 a quick follow up to that. Uh, have you met any of the Marcoses after People Power? Have you met them face to face? Yes, yes, yes. In the, in the hearings, hmm. we would have hearings because my remember the class distribution, attorney Bob Swift, in fact, was a very important uh, aspect of the entire struggle. And Bob Swift and Rod Domingo sometimes would be with me. And uh, when Rod Domingo had died, I had to meet also. And then that was the first time when um, Bongbong Marcos came. And I was surprised because most of the time he would not. And I had met him sometimes at the Senate, although we would talk to each other. But when we were in the uh, uh, Makati Regional Trial Court, he came to me and he shook my hand. So I gave my hand and I was civil. And uh, he said, no, he, he was quite civil. And the judge was sugary and, you know, really obnoxious. <laughs> he kept on calling Marcos vice president. Bagamat hindi patapos yung pagkatalo ni Marcos, he was already calling him vice president. Now, kung bastos ako, I would have said, why do you call him vice president? Hindi patapos ang laban niya. But there it was. And there, he was civil to me. Siguro he was embarrassed because he was being called vice president. Pero ako and Hilda was with me. We didn't, we didn't say anything. We just uh, allowed the judge to talk. I had talked to him. And then when the judge said, this might be, alam mo judge was so happy. This might be the time when we can actually forge an agreement between you. And that was his objective. <clears throat> and is this the first time that you are able to talk to each other? And it was Marcos who answered, of course not. We've talked to each other a number of times. And then I said, yes, we knew each other before. Good. Um, second question. Imelda Marcos, as he said, was convicted of graft and corruption in 2018 and, and sentenced to at least 42 years in prison. However, she is still not in jail. And uh, why is uh, Imelda and why and how is that Imelda is not in prison for all her crimes? Yeah, in November, when this was announced, November 2018, she applied <coughs> for bail at the Sandigan Bayan and uh, actually appealed her case to the higher court, which was the Supreme Court. And of course, what happened there was that for as long as the Sandigan Bayan held on to her case and did not bring it to the higher court, the Sandigan Bayan had jurisdiction. But once the Sandigan Bayan brought the, the case to the Supreme Court, which was their appeal, then the, the, the this is the principle of residual powers take over and they lose jurisdiction over the case. So that is what happened. And for purposes of her age, and at, the time, at that time, she was in a wheelchair. You remember when somebody was with a neck brace? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, in, she was in a wheelchair and her age actually allowed her at least to go on house arrest because I remember that I was still in the House of Representatives when we came out with a policy that once you reach the age of 70, you should be out for release and you can only stay in your house or the hospital, but no longer in jail. And this was the time of Gloria Macapagalaroyo, <laughs> who actually you know, stayed on house arrest when she was arrested. But she was arrested and she stayed in the hospital. Enrile was arrested and he stayed in the house. So not, not arrested sila, but in, the, in this case, Imelda Marcos just ignored the whole proceedings. And when the whole thing was promulgated, she was in the party 
of uh, Aimee because it was Aimee's birthday. She just ignored the whole thing. So medyo galit na galit kami, no? Why wasn't she being arrested? But she filed for, but you know, the policy <clears throat> actually could be looked at in consideration. At least the Philippine National Police were looking at that. And they filed for Supreme Court. So the moment, the moment the Sandigan Bayan using the rules of court brought her appeal to the Supreme Court, then the residual powers take over and she loses. The Sandigan Bayan loses jurisdiction over the case and uh, it is now in the Supreme Court. But something is funny. We're trying to look for Imelda Marcos's case number in the Supreme Court, but we have not yet found it. And no case hearing has yet been convened in the Supreme Court regarding the conviction of Imelda Marcos. Maybe that is what we should be looking for. And I have to be looking at that, Eric. And because, you know, between now and 2022 will be the elections, it will be a good time to find out. She is convicted for 42 years. Huh? Remember that? Mm -hmm. she, pay, she actually paid bail. She paid bail, 250000 given all her uneven and unexplained wealth. And then she paid another amount, 300000 And that was when the Sandigan Bayan lost its uh, residual powers and brought the case to the Supreme Court. So that is how the status stands. It is now in the Supreme Court. So, tuloy ang laban, uh, Eta. Um, Follow-up, John, is, uh, well, Bong Bong Marcos has already uh, declared that he's running for uh, president uh, in the May, 22, May 2022 elections. What are your uh, views on this, especially when recent surveys say that Bong Bong Marcos rates as the number two choice in the presidential race, especially in the national capital region? What do you attribute this apparent popularity of Bong Bong Marcos? This apparent popularity of Bong Bong Marcos goes back and must be traced back. 42 years when before they declared martial law. It is a mindset that has been established effectively by the Marcoses. It is a mindset of, they call it constitutional authoritarianism, that you can't ever bring about you know, development in society unless you have authoritarian rule unless you have disciplinary rule. And that is the reason why they have to have the military and the Philippine National Police within their uh, hold. So this is the kind of thing that they enjoyed. And uh, how, this, how did this develop? Well, the base was developed by paying this um, constituents to be loyal to them. I understand, and rumors are flying. So call them rumors, Eric. Mm -hmm. Rumors are flying that Marcos is busy and he has a lot of money. Remember that the unexplained wealth that they had, PCGG says that they were only able to um, collect about five of the 10 dummy foundations. And so there were five dummy foundations that had yet not been collected. So this is where you find Aimee Marcos's investments in the British Virgin Islands and a lot of unexplained wealth in so many banks all over the globe. This is what Stanislaw says that, you know, they have the government has not been able to collect all the unexplained wealth of the Marcoses. And this unexplained wealth or the illegal or unlawful wealth 
of the Marcoses is now being used to feed on, to pay off loyalists from way back. Remember that he was 20 years in office. So old soldiers, retired, and the young. He's very good at getting the young. It's a subtle, if you look at the subtle, um, did man sa TikTok yan, no? but the so social media, very subtly, they try to explain to the young people uh, that during the Marcos days, these were the golden days of Marcos. And then they talk about the edifices, the highways that had been built, the, build, the structures, the, all the hospitals that had been built. And the young, vulnerable young, are impressed. So that's, that's the formidable resist, uh, base that we still have to fight. And you do not have total control over that, especially when you don't have the resources where they have all the resources. <clears throat> yeah, right now they have control no? under Duterte. They never had it so good under Duterte because Duterte idolized the father. This was the only time that they allowed, you know, the burial of Marcos in the Bilibingan ng mga bayani because Duterte was inaugurated as president with a generous contribution coming from Imelda Marcos. Ay, Imelda, sorry, from Aimee Marcos. So if you look at the Duterte and Marcos comparison, there's really not much. There's chronic capitalism. So kinalaban daw nila ang oligarchs. They won on a platform of lies. Kinalaban daw ang mga Marcos. Ng, di ba si, si Marcos? I am going to destroy the oligarchs. The rich people who control Congress, who control political power. I am going to destroy that. So totoo, marami siyang inuli ng mga oligarchs. Pero he made his own oligarchs and they call them the crony capitalists who borrowed from the funds of Marcos, uh, from the funds of government and you know, were able to set up their own private investments and their own companies. <clears throat> uh, as a follow-up question uh, to those uh, methods of how the Marcoses uh, tried to uh, refurbish their reputation, uh, how can ordinary Filipinos fight the historical distortions that are being made and propagated by the Marcoses and their followers? Has there been uh, a lack of uh, institutional, uh, educational uh, uh, correction to the historical record during the past, what, uh, 20, 30 years post-Marcos? Has the educational institutions in particular failed in educating the Filipino people? When I was uh, <clears throat> when I was chair of the Commission on Human Rights, I convened a meeting between the Commission and the Higher Education, which was Ched, which was Tati Likwanan at the time, and the DepEd, which was Brother Armin. And uh, I asked them with candor how you know the institutions treated the Marcos regime. And both of them admitted that there was no serious effort to try to bring about the truth regarding the Marcos regime. And so that's it. Wow. Institutional that flaw. That was an institutional flaw. And can you imagine that? That's from the time of Cory Aquino to young brother Armin that was already Kikuan, panahon na ni panahon na ni uh, Kuan, uh, Pinoy. President Pinoy. So natapos, Cory Aquino could not do it. Well, why? Why not? Educational institutions are so important. They are strategically important because they mold they mold the, the, the thinking of the young people. And the thinking of the young people right now, you know, Eric, 
the when you talk about the millennials and then the generation z they make up 35 percent of the voting population and pagka yung alakhan nito eh mga mga kwan, sweet and innocent and ignorant of the truth that had happened during the marcos days and even the truth of what is happening right now and then they're vulnerably they, they can easily be they can to you know believe what is happening through media the media of the marcoses and the media of today under the yeah. thank you for that clarification uh, yeah we'll have about three or four questions and we'll be ending uh, hopefully in the next uh, 10 15 minutes uh, just want to let you know at the um let me see uh, okay as the former chairperson of the commission on human rights in light of the recent international criminal court investigation uh, authorization for the crimes of the duterte administration against humanity from 2011 to today do you think this investigation will prosper did your office receive any reports of this Parasidos in Davao City during your term in 2010-2015? If yes, is there enough evidence to convict Duterte and his co cohorts from a viewer in Luzon? When I was chair of the Commission on Human Rights, I took over from uh, now Senator Laila de Lima. Uh, she was about ready to come up with a resolution with respect to EJKs or extrajudicial killings that were taking place under um, the mayor, mayor then, mayor, mayor uh, uh, Duterte. And uh, I looked at, at her resolution. So I tried to finish and complete the resolution. But by then, we were no longer allowed to go into the, the, the Vow City and to go into the areas where they were you know, rumored to have skeletons that were dumped into the subdivision of a certain friend of theirs whose name I have forgotten. And so uh, we just had to complete this by trying to salvage some of the witnesses whom we could salvage. And we finished the resolution. Clarissa, what's her name? a mother of five children who were killed under the, the Duterte administration was there. And we uh, had that, we, were, we brought that out and we finished this resolution and we brought this to the ombudsman with the recommendation that the Philippine National Police, there were about 21 of them who, should, who were guilty and who were culpable of having directly killed uh, extrajudicial killings, you know, summary killings, and that uh, Duterte must be further investigated to make him criminally liable. Um, so this was the um, resolution that we had. Oh, we had a lot of desaparecidos and summary killings of these um, <laughs> to, to, under the Duterte regime when he was mayor. And uh, when I brought it to the ombudsman, she accepted this. This was Chief Morales at that time. But I found out from media, by then media was very open. I found out from media, and I think this was GMA 7, that told me that actually the Philippine National Police had already been investigated even prior to what I had given. Uh, the, to the ombudsman. So now they were, you know, actually they were captured, but what, you know, what do they do with a the policeman? They bring them to, they bring them to other areas. You know, nangyayari sa kanila, they locate them in other destinations, but, uh, and it didn't really take long before they were released. In the case of, uh, ang sabi namin, dito kay Duterte, 
he should be criminal. He is criminally liable, but he needs further investigation. And so in that regard, they held that as a recommendation. So who can further investigate Duterte? Either the ombudsman or the new MBI, because the chair of the commission, the Commission on Human Rights, do not they we do not have investigative. I mean, we don't have prosecutorial prosecutorial powers, so we can only investigate. That's our weakness. So we had that, and anyway, 2013 came, and elections came. And natapos yung anak niyang si Sara Duterte and he vied for being a mayor again. Because by that time, it was Sara who was the mayor and he was already a, he was actually a former congressman. Nakasama ko pa nga siya sa, nakasama ko pa siya sa, sa house. We were both in the minority. And he never spoke a word when he was there and he was just so humble. And I, when I would visit him in Davao City, I'd even make him give him a courtesy call. Tapos pakakanin pa niya ako. Yung ganun eh. He was such a humble guy at that time. Doon sa mga colleagues niya in the House of Representatives. So he won. And then when he won, sinabi ko kay Kwan sa ombudsman, aren't you going to further investigate him? At that there is such a thing as the aguinaldo policy. Yung Aguinaldo policy, pag nanalo ka na, everything is wiped out. Your past is wiped out. So, hindi ka na pwedeng iimbestiga. Kasi nanalo ka and the people voted for you. That's a silly, stupid policy. No? The Supreme Court has already repealed it. But that's what happened to him. So that's what happened to my resolution. Wow. Yun. Terrible. Um... Let me see. Uh, before we got two more questions, uh, between do, did I miss any important questions that were that were posted on the chat page? Between, are you still there? I think we're good, sir, with the questions. Okay, I'll, I'll just let, end with this. Uh, I always end with this question to our town hall speakers. Uh, Etta, do you think uh, that we? Uh, as the Filipino people can end this culture of impunity, what can ordinary citizens do or contribute towards ending the culture of those who abuse power? This came from our Iggy and San Juan City, original question. Yes, that's a very good question. Of course we can. Truth to power is exposing those who wield power today about the truth of their performance, which is what is being done by COA and the Philippine Senate. They're doing a good job. Truth to power in another sense, and I always say this, is empowering the Filipino people and empowering them by telling them the truth so that when they are weaponized, when they are holding the truth in their hands, then, you know, the truism that the pen is mightier than the sword can be used and let the Filipino people do this. They were able to do it when they ousted Marcos in the People Power Revolution. And of course, that was a struggle that started way back in 1975. But if they were able to do it then, if we were able to do it then, we still can do it now. Don't ever give up. Because the essence of struggle, the meaning of struggle is to do to, you know, next to a complete situation of freedom is the struggle for freedom. I think it was Leanne who said that. Next to that. And I think that we should find, find glory and beauty and meaning in the struggle for freedom that we are now doing for a better Philippines, for a freer Philippines, 
for a humane and more just Philippines. Yes, we can do it, Eric, if we thank all try. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question I nearly forgot. Um, uh, are you optimistic? Uh, since I know you're very involved with the Isang Sambayan uh, coalition to have a unified uh, uh, democratic opposition to the Duterte administration, uh, how's, how's the, what's the situation now with the Isang Sambayan in the forthcoming deadline of the filing of candidacy? We're going to have our own Pulso ng Sambayan at the end of the month. This will be on 30 September. Media has been naughty and has been asking us, what if the, you know, the candidates are not yet finished with their own uh, filing of their certificates of candidacy? Well, that is okay. We will have our own and we will just continue. What if your candidate is not able to file a certificate of candidacy? from October 1 to October 8th, what are you going to do? We will have our own process. <laughs> As Justice, uh, Justice Tony Gardio, you know, wisely said, we have our own process and we will go through with our process. And, you know, I believe in that because in our meetings, we, you know, what I said, let us empower the Filipino people. Let us give them the basic issues that they need to know. And once they are empowered, let them decide who they want to vote for. That is Sambayan. Sambayan will rely on the Filipino people as empowered citizens between now and uh, May 2022. And to us, that is what is most important, that we have empowered citizens voting for the correct person that will believe in you know a more humane society that is why our first thing to say is no to the systemic autocratic despotic rule of a marcos duterte tandem that is number one and then yes to a more humane just and democratic Philippines. Let us vote for democracy. Let us not vote for autocracy. Thank you for your wonderful insights, uh, Ms. Eta Rosales. And uh, now we are gonna have our closing remarks from uh, Dr. Randy Tuanio, uh, the vice chair of Insight Gov, our partners in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Dr. Tuanio. Just uh, unmute yourself, Randy. Uh, thank you. Okay. Sorry, sorry, Eric. Uh, thanks again, Eric. Uh, and also thank you also to Eta no, for the very, uh, very inspirational speech. No? On the International Center for Innovation, Transformation, and Excellence in Governance, a co-sponsor of this forum, I would like to thank you all for attending this forum on the Living the Martial Law Years, organized by the U.S. Filipinos for Good Governance, and also the Inside Gov. The USFGG and the Inside Gov would sincerely like to thank one of its members, former Human Rights Commission Chair and Congresswoman Rosales, who provided certainly her perspectives on martial law by moving the movingly discussing her experiences on what happened during the period and also the gruesome effects of torture that she experienced. Her reflections during this period and the effects of Marcos policies and also their illegal wealth and corruption on the economic, political, and social life of Philippines also at present. As an economist, certainly the martial law years have brought misery and marginalization to the country. The decline in national output that the Philippines has experienced this past year in the pandemic is only surpassed by the decline that we experienced to, uh, during the twilight of the martial law years in 1983 and 1984. And only in the early 2000s, almost 20 years after that period, that we were able to recover from that decline. It's not only in the area of human rights abuses, but also in the abject poverty and marginalization that the country experienced during this period. We hope that we can organize similar fora on the martial law again in the future as we are closing in on its 50th anniversary next year. And we have seen similar patterns of human rights abuses and economic mismanagement in the last past few years 
as Etas Eloquent Listed. I hope that you can also browse our Facebook pages, HTTPS www.facebook.com inside Gov for similar events. And we are pleased to inform you just we just launched an online forum, forum platform that aims to com commemorate, memorialize, humanize the victims and the narratives around President Duterte's war on drugs campaign called Stop Killings. Uh, and it's in a website, stopthekillings.ph. Again, on behalf of the Inside Gov, I would like to thank you for attending the forum today and hope to see you again in future events. Thank you, Professor Tuanyo, for that uh, good uh, closing remarks. Um, I, are we going to have a closing prayer, uh, Loida, or between if you're still? Are we good? Between just a short closing.